Hey everybody, um, today's episode features Simon Eiden, Simon Eden in German. He's a German osteopath. Uh, he works with many NBA players. He also has an experience of winning the Australian Open um, with, with one of his clients. And today he told, told the stories about it and how he treated the, the tennis player. Um, it's, it's a lot of interesting um, treatment stories for people who are interested in that profession. Uh, about fascia, about favoring one side about sports that are one-sided like tennis or baseball versus team sports or ball sports that are a little bit less one-sided and um, comparing injuries, talking about certain kinds of injuries uh, which take longer to recover from um, and a whole bunch of life stuff. Uh, I, uh, it was a dual podcast because it, this podcast will also be featured on his podcast. It will be his first one. Uh, so he also asked me a lot of questions and I was keen to answer them. So uh, you can also hear a little bit of my story if you haven't heard so yet. And you'll hear some stories from my background. And uh, I hope you enjoy. It's it's a different one. It's an exciting one because uh, he's currently in the U.S. and we had to find the time to, to make it work. And um, yeah, we talked a lot. <laughs> we did talk a lot. So please enjoy. Please subscribe to this channel down low. And um, I'll see you soon. Simon, or Simon, 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 uh, German heritage. <laughs> We're going to keep it English today. Yes, sir. What's up? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm in Berlin for, for one day, your town, my town, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're in separate cities right now. Uh, where are you at right now? Uh, I'm in Houston since yesterday. Houston. Okay. Is that your, uh, your original base before you're in the process to move to Boston or is, is, uh, no, nah, no, nah, it was good. It's quite, it was quite crazy. So I just moved to the U S in November, 2019 and moved to Chicago originally and uh lived there for two years had an apartment in in boston as well at the same time for six months and then we went to houston expecting to stay here a little bit longer and <laughs> surprise surprise and that in that industry didn't last too long and now <laughs> we're looking to move to boston so just for the people to understand um we also only recently met uh, also thanks to Raina Maistayan, our, our common friend who made the connection. Um, you are an osteo, uh, if I may generalize it. Uh, there are osteo, there's different osteo schools, but also, uh, I mean, we're doing a dual podcast here. You're, you're, you're going to ask me questions as well, just to, be, just to be clear for everybody, because you're also in the process of starting your own podcast. But I want to get back into your, into your background first. So let's talk about you first of how you came to, to being a therapist and focusing on the osteo uh, profession and what, what brought you to that? Uh, so I was a basketball player myself growing up. I was always tall. So I tried to, to find a sport that I didn't look too clumsy at. And uh, I just started playing basketball at a, at a young age. And uh, I, honestly, I didn't have uh, nearly as much talent as the guys I'm working with today, but I just still had like a, like a big passion for it. And um, talking about the clumsiness, I had enough uh, injuries over the years and um, just went to, to different therapists uh, and, and couldn't have been more surprised about the different approaches even in Germany back then. So um, when I was the age of 17, honestly, my best time probably back then, I just uh, went to an osteopath in, in Berlin uh, with a spread ankle and was uh, surprised how fast he fixed it and never felt like, uh, like that before. I felt like light as a feather and uh, was flying around. So I was like, okay, that's, that's quite magical. So um, my whole family has like quite some, some medical background, nurses and, and all that, not too academic, but at least there's like a, like a big interest. And um, I just went that route and just wanted to become, initially I wanted to become a sports doctor, but uh, I never wanted to lose the contact, like the, the really close contact to athletes, because that's what my whole life was about. And sports physical therapy was uh, an interesting approach for me. And that's how I just uh, decided to go that route. And um, yeah, just went to physio school, how successful back then, because my focus was still on basketball. But once my, my knee got completely destroyed, <laughs> I uh, shifted focus. And as every, every athlete knows out there, like if you have like a, like a really passionate focus for something and 
are able to shift it to something else, it's uh, actually pretty easy to, um, yeah, just uh, get successful at what you do. Yeah, I I do have a soft spot for osteo um, osteopath in general, just because that's I think why we connected as 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 well as we did, because. I have the same path as you. I had injuries. I had to stop playing. I was going through a tough time with my injuries as a professional already. And it was to a point where I was like a year without knowing which direction to go, going from therapist to therapist until I found an osteo close to the city I was living or playing in. And he was the first one to put me on the right path. And that's since then, I had a really a extraordinary amount of trust in osteo. I mean, not everyone is probably, you know, Every osteo as every every patient has their own osteo that that can fit together, but I know also that the profession is very expensive and it's also a very long journey of learning. And I know there's a school that's the the main school originates from the Netherlands, but you had your education through a U.S. based osteo, as I understand, or is is that something yeah. that I misread? No, so interesting enough, I think that's the story I told you initially that osteopathy was actually founded by by someone in the US, Andrew Taylor still, and uh, it was later brought to the UK and then it shifted into the Netherlands. And okay. over the years, it just um, became such a such a diverse therapy approach that like every nation has its ha has its very own approach like the us but basically you become a medical doctor but it's still like a different approach in europe it's really like on hand therapy feeling into the body uh kind of get to know where the dysfunction is which is oftentimes or i would always say 98 percent far away from the actual pain area and then just get to treat the the we real key lesion key problem so mm -hmm. that's just how i learned it i learned it in a school in germany all over germany but the school originated in the netherlands okay all right good history lesson <laughs> <laughs> okay it's your turn now like now you gotta you gotta squeeze the jews out of me the, the juice yeah so i i just found it really interesting so i mean as you know in the basketball industry you meet a lot of people barely you ever see a scout just because you guys always stay in the back and just like observing so uh, i just found it really interesting to meet you and i just feel um we both have a have a unique p a path in a sense that we both german and like i feel in the basketball industry over here it's really rare so what just interests me is like how you basically became the scout for the Boston Celtics. It's funny you say with both German. I do feel German, but I do have a passport that's Lithuanian. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't want to take that away from you. I apologize. Yes, no. you are Lithuanian as well. <laughs> it is. It is a proud nation. So we do. We do represent whenever we can because we are so little compared to Germany. But I do feel internally, which I will also publish an article about about the. Um, I want to call it cultural, cultural dysphoria because in the different cultures I, I grew up in and the different, yeah. the different mentalities I experience and the different languages I speak, I have a different personality in each of them. And I will go into that uh, through the, the article I will publish at some point. I'm just like brainstorming for myself and really internalizing everything. Um, but my, my background is totally unique in the sense that I never, I never aspired to be a scout i never aspired to go this route so that's a funny rhyme too but <laughs> but i i i was always i only had my eyes set on becoming a professional basketball player uh, my father was a professional my mom was a, a team handball pro uh, professional until she 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 got me <laughs> basically <laughs> i ruined her career um but in general I aspired to be a professional player and I, I became one um, through a, a very unique route also because I played second division in, in, in the States. Uh, I went back, played for my hometown, which my father was coaching. So uh, I was, I was, you know, signed as a foreigner because I had a Lithuanian passport. And I like at that time I, I could have chosen to get a German one because I lived in Germany for over 10 years. After 10 years, you can choose. I chose to stay with my Lithuanian one and I was brought as an import which 
is you know playing in your hometown as an import is kind of weird, <laughs> yeah. but but I I I was committed. I I loved the game. I I was completely passionate about it until the injuries took its toll in the second year. I had to basically stop because I collapsed on the on the floor in a game. I couldn't run. I was I was done um, because of favoring one side after having so many knee surge uh, three two knee surgeries at the time. I had a third one later, but. <clears throat> After I stopped playing, I was looking for paths to get back in. But meanwhile, it was taking so long. As I said, I had to start doing something else. And I started to be an assistant coach for that team. I was committed. Um, I, I was doing scouting reports the way I knew it from college. That I received it. I just, you know, did, did put my own spin on everything. Like, as always, I put my own spin on everything. Uh, sprinkle a little bit of Benos on there. And... <laughs> And uh, I, I kept going from, from being a scout to uh, like becoming an assistant coach that was doing the scouting, that was doing the workouts, that was doing the warm ups, that was doing a whole bunch of different things uh, until I received a phone call from Kozlowskas uh, uh, that was at Seska at that time. And I told the story a million times. So I apologize for everyone who, who's, who's heard it in, in different languages or different aspects, but it is part of me. And um, I took I took that route to become a a a scout, a just doing scouting reports and and collecting the team, bringing information together for for the roster for next year. So I was doing both internal team scouting and external scouting of of players to 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 bring them to to Tesco. But um, again, I was I was close uh, because I was so frustrated. I was close to. Um, stopping all the basketball profession altogether because of the frustration of moving up to the first division, not ever getting a chance to coach and be an assistant coach in the first division um, because the budget was too little, the gym was too little, and I was close to being a, prof a personal trainer. So I had started to 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 do my my uh, exercises. I was doing my, my licenses, and then I just received a phone call. So I just up and left everything. Uh, and then at the first summer, I met my current boss, um, Austin Ainge, and he he introduced himself to me <clears throat> in a camp, uh, in, in a sorry, under 18 tournament in Poland. And uh, we just stayed in touch. I continued to work at Seska at that time. It was, you know, years passed. And at some point, um, there was an offer on the table that I had to, that I had to more than consider. Yeah. And and then the rest is history. So it just it just took off, and I never aspired to do that. Everybody asked me, "How do you become a scout?" I mean, there's no. If you ask everybody that are scouts, there's a a, a different story to everyone. So I can't. I, feel, I can't. I've, yeah, sorry. I feel there is. At the same time, I feel like all sports stories are like somewhat similar. Like I I feel like if I just compare my path to yours, it's just so interesting because at the end of the day, it's like. You have to be there. You have to deliver. You do great work, and at the end of the day, you just like get an offer eventually out of out of nowhere, out of somewhere, and it's it's gonna work out. Like I just feel like that's exactly how it worked for me. So that's why I just still feel it's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's sliding door moments are unpredictable, but they do reward people that are passionate and and want to work they're not afraid to work they they're hands-on people and i think that eventually doors will open up if you don't take shortcuts if you just are committed to your craft you will automatically get better i was i sucked in the beginning honestly <laughs> i sucked <laughs> so the more you you apply yourself to it the more the better you will get so i think it's just a matter of time and the better you get people notice it people notice that you are also a reliable person. I think it's a, a lot of things planned played to me that I I was I had a, my ethical compass was right. People feel that I have a uh, I have a high ethical compass and I want to do the right thing, and I hold myself. I I'm proud of that. Like I hold I hold my standard high to that. So I I try to do the right thing, and I'm not perfect. You know I'm not perfect uh, with my job. I'm not. I'm trying to just separate the good from the bad and try to be try to do the right thing whenever they arise and people see that people notice it and then doors open up automatically because they trust you as a person first yeah i just feel like for for me at least and for my field i just felt like and that goes back to the nation um I just feel as a German, you just grow up with like a like a thrive and a passion for precision and perfection, if that makes sense. Um, 
So I just feel I applied that to my work over and over and over again. And if there, if I feel in a treatment, something ain't perfect and something ain't just right there yet, then I just trying to figure out a way. And I just feel like this persistence is just something that we inherited from a culture that even, or especially maybe Lithuanians uh, apply to their daily work life as well. Um, I just feel I benefited from that a lot. I, I agree. I, the attention to detail that I was taught in German school uh, benefited me for a long time because I went, I went, you know, like to American high school as well. And I, I came to, to, from Germany with, with like a, a folder for each subject. Everything was, everything was had to be folded. Everything had to be separate. And in the U S I saw, I saw people and it was, it was cool. Like everybody, like I started doing the same thing in college. I just started putting everything in one folder and just separated it was more practical, you know, but in German, it was like folder for each subject, separate it, have it organized, know where things are at and different colors for everything. I mean, it was all like just this very tedious, but it, it at the end, it taught me, it gave me a good foundation to, yeah. to, to be organized. I would definitely say that goes back to our work too, because I feel like my clients that I have, respective clients or whatever, I work with teams are like, they they basically sat on the on a case to case basis, right? Like I just see every player as a as a single individual that I have to assess and to treat. And I just feel oftentimes in my experience so far here, there's like a certain pattern applied to each and every player. And I just feel, especially in your work in in the scouting industry or, or job, it's just like so important to see like the individual talents and individual like positivities and, and talents a player brings onto the table for for a respective team yeah there's there's i mean every play like you said like every player is different every player has has their own uh pros and cons just like you said like every player has a different structure of, of what's what could be wrong with them physically and and you know i have to assess that from the outside of of how his mechanics are working sometimes how not only shooting mechanics, but biomechanically, is he running? Is he running correctly? Is there some? Uh, are they prone to injury? Is there a certain like running style that you think is more prone to injury than, than others? Is, are there like question marks that you raise yourself that could stand out when when people are scouting? That's a yeah. I mean, that's a that's a really interesting thing that you say that because I feel like oftentimes it's like easy to say that at the same time or easy to see at the same time it's really problematic because a 17 18 year old is just like so formable you know like you still can like like mold them so the problem with a lot of players that i see from a really young age is that they are able to to basically compensate their body and like the issues that they're walking around for such a long time that in the first place, it's not often easy to say, yeah, their, their ACL is going to pop within the next two years. You know, like oftentimes it's a process of like compensating many other injuries, hamstrings in the first year and the second year they have like repetitive ankle sprains. And that all tells you a story where you pretty surely later on can say, okay, this guy is prone to injury. It's pretty easy to say, okay, this guy might have an ACL by the age of 27, 28 if he ain't treated properly okay but what, what if you see i mean i, I guess I, I understand there's a progression to favoring and then injuries come up muscle tears acls what hip, hip out of alignment mostly but how do you do you do you think that there is like a correlation between the high hips and knees like is there is there some something that's maybe more prone uh of of being injured at some point where there's like yeah. the, the the hips are a little bit too high and a little, uh, are out of alignment uh, that you can immediately assess i mean in my point of view is that if a 17 year old 18 year old young player already has stiff hips like that definitely is like one of the most important keys for later on injuries but you oftentimes just see it in the way like a, like a player is, is running on the floor, like a player is moving sideways, how a player really reacts to certain things, how his body control is. And I definitely can tell you from experience in like 99% of the guys, the core stability just lacks. And that's just like something where you always are prone to injury. And in today's schedule that even those young players have, it's like sometimes even tough to implement. So like, it's just really all about the team and how the team really assesses a player and wants to develop those players. 
but there's no no like time of no return i mean there's always time to to really uh improve that and get stronger right oh 100 percent, yeah okay um so what do you th what do you feel like are the most common issues players deal with like especially especially like, let's stay with basketball right now but what, what are mo most common issues in basketball that you feel like i mean i feel i think the most important issue in basketball applies to all sports is just weak feet like we, we just like spend our whole fucking day. Sorry for that word, but we just spend all day in, in shoes, which means that we like weaken our feet. Nowadays, basketball shoes have like the softest soles on earth just to, to make it more comfortable to the body to just, you know, spend so much time in those shoes mm -hmm. at the end of the day that they just weaken the, the, the feet. So that's just like an upstream problematic because as soon as your feet are weak, you will definitely change the biomechanic con, uh, that goes to your knee, goes to your hip, goes to your lower back and affects your whole body, which just means like you have a lack of stability. And now we're talking ACL. Now we're talking all major injuries in a, in a, from, from a longer lo longevity perspective. So that means if your feet are, are weak, you just already change your change your biomechanic into like a negativity, which means that you just have like a higher risk to get severely injured. So, okay. Like having a weak base, weak feet, what, what body part compensates the most when the, when the feet are weak? Legit every body part, but it goes mostly into the, in, into the hips and into the lower back at first. So if you see a player that has like extremely lower back issues with like an increased intensity of of practice and 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 games etc it's just always like a sign for me that something is wrong right in the basement mm -hmm. i mean you see it in the house like you, you could even take it a little bit further and say okay in a cervical spine but like th that just takes so much so much compensation time that i wouldn't go with that at first but of course that's where it's going to land too because you just like the, the the best example is building a house right if the basement is not not measured right and not even mm -hmm. you will you will get cracks in the roof eventually mm -hmm. at some point so yeah. it's just a, it's just the exact same thing interesting um yeah what like it, i was i was thinking about the different sports right i mean you had you had the for the um experience of working with soccer players uh basketball players and also you won with or under 18 australian open no, that was the real Australian Open. The real 18. Australian Open. Yeah, 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 that was that was basketball under 18, which I'm still even more proud about than the Australian Open Championship because it was the first one, and it was a was quite a hustle back then. But anyway, yeah. Uh, but Australian Open and and, and tennis uh, is a big deal too, as well. So yeah. let's talk about tennis a little bit. T tell me about that experience. I mean, it's like it, it just like in basketball, it's like always depending on the style of player plays. Uh, I played with a player that was really defensively strong. So she just tried to, you know, like save every, every ball, which means like it's it's short, quick sprints that go straight into the back. And that's exactly where the issues were. So we barely started working together for like, I think, six weeks before we went to Australian Open back then. And uh, first round, that was the biggest issue. She couldn't just walk after the first round pretty much. She couldn't move. So that was quite interesting for me because if you watch a, watch a player play their sports and it doesn't matter really what sport it is, it's just always so important to just see how they move and see how they react. She was, as I said, really defensively. Um, and she really worked over her hip flexors, which means that they were like just insanely tight after the first round game. And I never touched the back to to really solve the problem. We just went over the hip flexors and it goes back to the osteopathic kind of approach. Um, hip flexors, diaphragma, every every part that affects the lower back from, from a different perspective was, was exactly what was in dysfunction after the game or was completely fired, right? So everything was insanely tight. That's what we worked on. And like two days later, she was back on the court. And a few days later, she won She won the whole thing. So it just really felt like a personal kind of success story, if that makes sense. So I was like kind of proud after that. But of at the course. same time, at the same time it, it is just the, the business we are in, right? I had like a, like a player that played for Milwaukee Bucks in the playoffs in 2019, had, had insane issues on the outside of the knee and wasn't able to move really. And um, I took two treatments to to really fix the issue. Um, that's just the, the the fun this job brings with it, basically. Can you mention the Australian Open uh, winner 
or is that something? Oh you yeah, keep? no, no, it was uh, Angie Kerber in the finals against uh, Serena Williams back then. Awesome, so man! That that's was, that was definitely big. Yeah. That must be a, a a really rewarding experience because you like actively contributed to to her success while she was locked up and and couldn't walk. So, um, how how did you meet her? Anyways, like how did you how did that align? So back then I lived in Frankfurt because I moved from Berlin to Frankfurt because Berlin had way too many too too much uh, distraction and I was just like I was 22 years old when I moved to Frankfurt. I was 26, I believe, 27 when I worked with uh, Kerba back then. Um, but I just moved away from the distraction, but Frankfurt was a workaholic city, which was perfectly fine for me. Uh, and I met someone who worked with another player, uh, Andrea Petkovic back then. And she took me to uh, China back then to, to tournaments in Beijing and Wuhan, and we just worked and she didn't do that great. She had a really low back then. And that's how I met uh, Kerber back then. And then Petkovic said, man, I don't know if I'm going to retire anytime soon. If you want to work with someone else, uh, you're more than welcome. And Kerber made me an offer, kind of. Um, I went to, uh, I worked with soccer national team back then as well in Germany. So I went to a training camp with them. Um, and it was a back and forth with Kerba back then, but I didn't really know if I would go to Singapore a week later or not. And on the day the trip was supposed to happen, I got a call on my way back from the training camp with the soccer national team back home. I was sitting in a train in Germany and I uh, got a call if I could be at the airport in five hours and pack my stuff to fly to Singapore with Kerba. So, I mean, that was an easy decision. I went home. Um, which I barely had. I mean, I was constantly on the road back then. So I just packed my shit and went to the airport and flew to, to Singapore with her. And that's just how it all started. A few weeks later, we flew to uh, Australia. The rest is history. <laughs> the, rest, the rest is history. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sliding door moments, man. You can't, you can't predict them. There, there's such a, there's such a, you know, reward at the end if you take advantage of that. I mean, you clearly did, and you 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 have memories from that. So it's it's really, um, I'm happy for that. I'm happy for people that are successful, that that are yeah. loving their craft and hardworking. Oh, um, I couldn't I couldn't imagine to do anything else ever again. Like it's just it just bucks a lot of people that don't know what they really want to do. But mm -hmm. I couldn't be any more certain. But my greatest success story brings me actually to yours because like no it's actually that 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 was my highlight in my career so I would just be curious what what was yours um i gotta say national team i mean that's the, the yeah. lithuanian pride is is such a big thing and as hard as the championships were each summer i spent eight summers with the national team and it was um the most rewarding we, we won two silver medals during those eight those eight years I was there, and 2013 was the first year, and we won it. Uh, in a, we lost yeah, in the final to France wow. right away, but um, the silver medal does not have the same worth to me, if I can say so, because I just it was my first championship, and I couldn't grasp everything that was going on. I was like, it was such a big. I knew what I was doing. I couldn't sleep the whole time. I was just working, and I was like, it was just a blur. You know, it was so difficult. Yeah. It was just like one game after another. And and it was my first. So I was still learning as I was going because it's the, it's the next level, it's next echelon. But the most rewarding experience, the biggest rewarding feeling that I had was 2015. Uh, and it was like back to back because we, the, the semifinal win against Serbia was such a, like you made it to the final. It's like, it was you you cannot imagine the emotions that we felt like in little with, with like i don't know how many thousands there was third i don't know it was a huge sta stadium that was full of people and the emotional outpour you have after that is so hard to bring it back in for the final you know because you just like you you basically like made it to the final you feel like there's nothing else that you can do so i kind of regret certain things that we just kind of we, we couldn't bring it back together, you know, like as, it's an yeah. experience because 2013, it was the same. And I was hoping that the, the group could learn from that because the majority of the group was still there, it could learn and regroup faster. It's so hard to regroup fast, to regroup fast enough for the final. And um, France did it in 2013 because they lost in 2011 in Lithuania. 
they they knew how to regroup again and they beat us in the final 2015 Spain was very good to, in regrouping because they just had an experienced bunch that knew how to really handle themselves and they beat us in the final but the one the win in the semifinals to make it to the final and also qual- qualifying for the Olympics at the same time was like right. I, di- I didn't even understand that we qualified until the head coach said it in the speech and I was like I I totally forgot about that because that yeah. was not the, that was not the main objective but it's such a it was such a achievement that I hold very dearly in my heart and I I just keep thinking about it when there's like there's it's it's a good memory for sure a good memory. and the, the other memory that has to do with the follow up is that uh walking into a Olympic stadium in Rio with with 100 100,000 people there and you just like I mean I was filming I was laughing I was waving the flag I was just I was like a little kid yeah, it was, I can it, only it was, imagine yeah, it was it was amazing. Um, let's get back to tennis because I wanted to I wanted to a- ask you to compare the a- the problems athletes have to sports that are like tennis, golf, baseball, one sided sports, uh, to regular ball sports, which are also more or less one sided because soccer you kick it with the mo- mostly with one foot. Basketball right. you if you are a one foot jumper you jump. I was always a one foot jumper, so I had one sided um uh, uh, problems swimming is something that's more better alignment probably but is there like you, do you see certain problems that you have to deal with in one sport and not in the other i mean you have always sport specific compensation patterns like like every sport has its own really movement patterns which means like you will always have like certain muscle groups more activated in 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 one sport than the other tennis obviously is like a insane swing it's like an insane like um you know, hit it basically for the shoulder that goes mm-hmm. in the, into a completely different pattern than it is in basketball. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, there was like a discussion and so many studies over the past decade, almost probably longer than that, about exactly that. And uh, if or if not, you want to bring an athlete basically on, on if you want to zero them in, right? If you want to like trying to compensate, recompensate the compensation pattern, if that makes sense. Yeah. And yeah. I hate to do that uh, as long as there is no problem, right? It always depends. I feel, I feel like every every joint, every muscle should be just right in function, which is something you will know with like certain experience. At the same time, I don't want to I don't want to bring them completely out of their movement patterns because otherwise they won't hit a, a single free throw anymore. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like it's just mm-hmm. like muscle memory effect and you just mm-hmm. really have to be careful in how far you want to go into compensating those, into compensating those muscle memory effects and, and affecting the nervous system. So that's why like for me, it's just like I deal with problems and of course, prevent them in terms of checking the body holistically, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So explain, explain like getting them loose, but not loose enough, basically. Yeah. Not, so not, for me, like, too loose. I mean, if you have a stiff midfoot, right? If you have a midfoot that doesn't move really well, go, going back to the feet again, which is my favorite topic, obviously, but like, it's just like super important. So going back to the feet, if a player, and it doesn't matter what player has like a, complete stiff immobile foot i will i will eventually like uh mobilize it and just make sure everything is moving properly Mm -hmm. will i like as soon as as long as it's a perfect tone of the muscle i won't i won't like completely relax you because like you won't be able to play the way you're supposed to anymore Mm -hmm. you know so like if a tennis player for example will always use their pack right if i if i like massage or treat your shoulder for hours it's it's not going to be beneficial unless you really have a severe issue if you have the severe issue it might be not really the pack probably more or less your 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 spine okay yeah. and, uh, and what about volleyball volleyball is the same thing like i mean volleyball is just like the it, it des- really applies to every sport to me like mm. if i if i work with volleyball players i just see okay what what might be going on if you have a certain issue where it might come in from um you will always have like some sort of like uh spine deformation if i want to call it that way like scoliosis or whatever what yeah. every orthopedic is going to tell you you have a scoliosis yeah of course you have a scoliosis you have a strong yeah. side in your body yeah um you will get insults from that orthopedic that oftentimes are completely uh, uh, 
faults just because they tell you one leg is shorter than the other, but like, don't really apply that to the whole body, right? Mm -hmm. Like they just barely ever do the right measurements. And it just like presses you even more into the compensation. And at the end of the day, oftentimes causes the the actual problem. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there an injury that's like devastating that you would say that's hard, hard, the hardest to recuperate from and, and definitely, definitely Achilles tendon. Achilles. Like I I feel I got to go with Achilles every day, all day, just because it's like such a difficult injury to come back mentally from Mm -hmm. physically. I mean, if you, if you have the right tools, if you have the right team surrounding you as a player, you, you will eventually come back. Um, mentally is the biggest part because you really got to trust that part again, which is just another reason why I would never work without a mental trainer like Reiner uh, on a client like that, just because you just like, that's the most important thing, right? You get injured. All right. First day of recovery. What are we going to do? Like, what's the team surrounding you? What are we going to do? Nutrition, treatment, mental health. That's all factors that playing in. And later on, of course, the training part. Again, holistic, holistic approach to the recovery as well. Super important. And I feel like nowadays still not important enough in a lot of teams, just because, I mean, you want your player to hit the court with full confidence into his body, right? You want the yeah. player to hit the court with the, with almost zero percentage to, to, uh, re-injure mm-hmm. himself. Okay. So let me ask you this, uh, wearing a, the, like a sleeve or something like that, is that because if it helps you mentally, does that some, is that supportive or is that counterproductive in the end? Because maybe there's something that that's happening physiology that I can't explain. Yeah. So my part is like, what, what do those things do? Right. They like compress your body a little bit, which is mostly what, what fascia is doing. Like muscle fascia is yeah. mostly like a, like a net surrounding your muscle that is supposed to stabilize the muscle. So like, if you, are necessarily have to wear this like sleeve whatever it is compression shorts whatever it is it's always the question like do you just have weak fascia or do you just feel cool or what's the reason why you want to wear it at the first time like right after an injury i completely support you to wear it but like in longevity of it you should get rid of it if your fascia is healthy and if you have a good interactive system does that does it prevent uh, let's let's say i put it on my knees because i had yeah. it on my knee on my knee and th- does does that prevent from uh, does the sleeve prevent the fascia from working properly i mean it's like everything right if you if you trying to uh, support a house from falling and it eventually won't fall but like the, the the house is like a passive structure now you have a passive structure in in terms of muscle and and, and fascia so if you want to activate it and just learn and teach it how to prevent injuries and how to help you it will be way more beneficial than wearing any kind of sleeve mm-hmm. so for me like even the guys with with like those those knee braces right those typical knee braces that every german and maybe lithuanian kid gets in europe to like help you with your oscar schlutter which is like in yeah. the most cases not even an oscar schlutter in my in my point of view but let's say a runner's knee or whatever it supports your knee passively to not do the work actively which goes back to me that this guy likely will need training to help him better like you know, compensate those problems really Mm -hmm. like strength, strength. It's, it's like, it's like the typical pill, right? It's the bandaid therapy. Like you Mm -hmm. have something, put a bandaid on, you have Mm -hmm. headache, put take a pill. Like, that's just like the kind of therapy it is, but it's not necessarily like a, like a long-term solution in my point. It's not a healing. It's that doesn't, doesn't support the healing process. Um, So taping or no taping for the ankles, if the feet are so important. I mean, I feel like the, 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 the question is taping all the time or taping at game time, mm. right? Taping all the time or taping at, at, at contact practice only. Like that's the questions for me, because like, if you tape, when you have contact, if you tape for a game, it prevents injuries for sure. It will, if you tape too rough, it might affect the knee. If you sprain your ankle, because it's mm-hmm. just the next joint above, mm-hmm. but I'm like still definitely there in that case, I'm old school. Like in that case, I definitely would say we got to tape for every game for every, because it just prevents injuries and like uh, have a, have a player be on the injury list for the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I mean, I I keep thinking about my college times of how, how my ankles were taped hard and my knee blew out. And, and like, I, I'm thinking, I'm not, I'm not, 
I'm just reflecting, thinking back about all this stuff. And also, obviously, my nutrition was shit as well in college, <laughs> eating pizza and everything. So it was not it was not ideal. So I, I think that a lot of factors play into it. And the younger you are, the more mistakes you do, uh, you make. Oh. 100% I mean but that applies to each and every one of us like even like non-athletes I feel because if you like you know look back what you did maybe 10 years ago you would do a lot of shit different nowadays but yeah. it's just always about do you have an old school kind of guy surrounding you in a team do you have an old school kind of approach in the in the franchise or whatever I feel like a lot of stuff is just like go hard or or don't do anything like this mm -hmm. you know like the whole ass like even german approach back then it's like yeah the hardest massage therapist is the best you know what i mean the cupping yeah. like yeah. like cupping like the more the more blood you see the more hematome you see after cupping the better it is the the greater the effect but so tell me about it, cupping tell me about cupping i mean you know like i i, I wouldn't say anything against it generally if if used wisely right if used as and how do you say if, if used as a substitute to proper therapy it's completely useless in my point of view because it's just like a passive kind of thing that's not really specific that goes back to my like specific and really precise approach when it comes to structures on the body just because i feel um let's say you have a, have a muscle that's kind of adhered right that doesn't move back we go back to the fascia you want to loosen it up which is completely fine. You can use cupping for that, but at the end of the day, it has to come from something, right? Fascia doesn't just adhere just because it wants to. It's just like, it shows you there is an issue somewhere else. You compensate because of something else. So it basically is again, a band-aid therapy. So you do cupping, you do needling, you're trying to get the muscle tone down, which is all fine. I, I would never arc with those therapies alone, but you have to combine it with like specific therapy that just has a little bit bigger meaning behind it. Look at the feed. Look, if you see some callus on the feed, you will see, does the player move well and do they use the feed well? Because if they don't, you have callus at specific spots on the feed. You will basically can tell, okay, this guy just walks weird. The guy is overusing his fascia the guy is overusing his muscle that's why the muscle tone is up this guy tries to protect a structure the body tries to protect the structure from completely overcompensating which means basically popping um so it tries to to basically you know protect the structure certain certain part of your body's fascia is is overcompensating when your feet are not working well or is is it or the whole fascia system uh... i mean it's always the whole system right if if some if, if someone pulls you on the feet you will feel it likely at some point somewhere on your ear now i'm just kidding but like you know what i mean <laughs> you just like it's like one net that's like it's like spider-man you put it all over the body and you just feel, will feel it eventually somewhere else so it, the best example now that i think about it is i had a I, I had a, um, an athlete whose uh, cecum was, was removed. Um, cecum? Blue thumb. Yeah, blue uh, thumb. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so like the, the, apart from the, from the gut. Um, I'll think of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that part was removed and had like a really bad scar that was affecting the whole surrounding areas because you just take like some skin away, which creates tension eventually. So like the whole like, kind of system around it where it's like the hip where it's like the 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 knee really close to it where it's like a lot of structures close to it um doesn't move that properly anymore so like at the end of the day you have to loosen it up break the scar tissue down and just works around it but like scars to me are like one of the most important and most interesting things especially for example after knee surgery right appendix like, appendix oh appendix yeah, see, sometimes I'm not that American. Me, me neither. So, still German <laughs> over here. I can't believe I, I I forgot about that. So so you're saying try to avoid rem removing the appendix um, as much as as long as you can. No, nah, I mean like if it's necessary medically, it's necessary. Like I'm not there right. to tell you what to do in that case. It's just like the the aftermath of it is really just important because if you don't do anything about the scar, it will it, it will eventually become really rigid. And as soon as it's really not moving that well, it will just affect every surrounding areas. The same applies to a shoulder surgery. The same. So scar to tissue, basically, scar tissue is is it can become the biggest issue for the rest of your system. Yes. I just mentioned the appendix surgery because it's something you wouldn't think of that fast, right? Yeah. Like if you yeah. have a hip problem, nobody thinks of about that issue. But it's just yeah. like 
affecting yeah. everything in in the surroundings. All right, I I, um, I also know from the history of osteo and and uh, from talking to also regular doctors that are, don't have the osteo um, uh, education background. Is there is there a, a clash of philosophies where where the two professions or the two spheres i don't know how to compare the two but um how is is there something that combined them but also there's there's clash between the two that don't really find a common denominator i mean i would say especially in the us there is so far based on the experience i made so far just because everything here is like the the approach is like we work you out like right we, we just do more training we do exercises to solve the problem which is completely fine as i said earlier because you eventually will need it to form foster form connection form neurologic like connection again but what comes in the first place and what's the real issue of it so i feel like when i discuss with uh, discuss discuss with client <laughs> discussion when, discussion, when, I, discuss, discussion. <laughs> when I discuss with clients uh, with, with with colleagues over here um how to approach a certain certain client's issue uh there are really oftentimes two complete different approaches and i can say that theirs is completely wrong I can only can say I would do it differently. And at the end of the day, we have the saying in Germany, at least he who heals is right. Right. So like, mm -hmm. if I can help you, you're right. The question for me always is just, is it just a pain that's gone in your ankle and we helped your ankle to heal or is the whole body still affected by one ankle sprain? Because like people don't think about it, right? If you have one ankle sprain, as I told you even, like we had a treatment and I told you your ankle sprain likely affected your whole body. So only treating the ankle after you hurt your ankle might really not it because you know from experience when you hurt your ankle, you walk a different way to avoid the pain. You will walk a different way. You don't trust it at the beginning when you play again, oftentimes, which means you still have compensation in your body. And unfortunately, our body has a really smart solution for avoiding pain and, and just bringing you in those compensation patterns, but really not to take those away again. So reprogramming the muscles in training, but also in like passive treatment to me is like the key to, to, to success. Okay, I've got another topic for you with, with that um, in mind placebo effect when when you treat when you treat uh, athletes and you 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 know what you're doing obviously you know what's which which parts are, are are affected the most do you feel that some some athletes are more vulnerable to to placebo to the placebo effect than others or is there something where you you've noticed in the past where you maybe you has haven't done as much as you well you you did your job but you didn't do as much as the effect end up being you know like the 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 player just ends up being like man i'm so loose that i can't believe and in in reality like you were just starting your first treatment you know and it doesn't necessarily end up being the heal healing itself oh absolutely i wish we could like uh call right now real quick to 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 ask about that topic but it's so mentally like every treatment is like so mental first of all it's always a question of trust right if you don't trust me as a therapist the treatment will fail eventually if uh you don't necessarily know what i did so far and know my my like resume like it just takes something away right if you know i treated this and this person you might trust me already a little bit more and will maybe fall for the treatment a little bit more but you will always be also will be able to let loose a little bit more if you trust me really mm -hmm. so it always has like some placebo effect but maybe it's not really a placebo effect maybe it's just more the trust effect and yeah ca causes the placebo effect if that makes sense that's a good point yeah, yeah that's a good point you know? because i feel like there's not many jobs or as uh, working with athletes where you just really have to to be fully trusted i just feel physical therapy or the sports physical therapist osteopath whatever is one of those um just because like you basically trust me with your body which is your full capital it's your yeah. full capital for your full future like that's yeah. going to feed your family that's going to feed you that's going to do everything for you well, you you have to once you lay on a table you have to let go you have, like you have to right. be loose you cannot be if you're uptight and you don't trust that person, then you might as well not sit on the table, not lay on the table. Right. It's 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 pointless. Um, where what do you got for me? 
I, I've, I've been asking you, I've been drilling you with questions here. Left yeah, and right. I love that. Um, no, I'm, I'm actually just curious, like we, we already had the, or your way, your journey a little bit, but I'm just curious, like, obviously you have a lot of stories to tell and have a lot of like history in your, in your craft. So I'm just like, actually curious about two things. First of all, what's, what's been your, your greatest experience so far? We had that, but secondly, what's your like, most memorized story you had like as a fun story besides all your all your journeys with the national team let's say you know like there are always those those like stories you will remember for the rest of your life in a in a funny way yeah i mean f national team was not funny a lot of times <laughs> no, that's that's a lot of hustle like that but just uh, maybe Ces maybe let's tesca tesca was not funny a lot of times either <laughs> no i i bet that but you told me for example a crazy story where you guys have been flying for forever to a different destination yeah only yeah, to that... play a game there so i feel like that's a that's actually a crazy story yeah, that was that was um, good thing you brought it up. I mean, I because I, I have sometimes it's hard to gather the right one, but that that's a good story because I, the my first year with with uh, with Seska, it was I was still mostly based in Moscow. I was traveling by myself to scout and doing advanced scouting to watch other teams, and preparing um, scouting reports and and things like that and sending them to the system coach. Um, that was that was my first full year that this i don't count the half a year before that that I, I came when i on my arrival but my first full year with with uh spheropolis as the assistant coach and then the season uh, is going um i don't remember what month it was it was like maybe i don't know maybe it was february march something like that and uh there's a trip to vladivostok that's like 11 hours flight i think i mean it's 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 a ridiculous flight it's basically japan it's basically on off, off the coast uh, still in russia <laughs> across across the street of across the ocean of japan yeah <laughs> it's, it's still russia and um we we flew i mean the assistant coach uh, the russian assistant coach had a back issues and he couldn't fly he had, he he was basically out and we needed another assistant. So Benes, as a rookie, gets your first journey all the way to Vladivostok. So I'm I'm excited as it gets. But the way we are preparing the trip to Vladivostok, because it's such a long trip. I don't remember how many hours, maybe six hours time difference, five hours, something like that. I, I want, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to be wrong here, but something like that. And they used to fly two days before and prepare and, and make sure they adapt, but you can't adapt in two days to, to a six hour time reference. So it ended up being bad for, for the team, for the players. It was just even worse, actually. Um, then while I was there, we started to plan the trip to fly in on the morning of the game. So we flew overnight, basically. And we arrived there on the morning of the game, which for us back in Moscow, is nighttime still it's like basically the time we go to sleep so we fly in we drive to the hotel we eat like a light dinner for us it's dinner for them it's breakfast but they serve us dinner to pretend that it's, it's dinner <laughs> so everybody is just everybody all the other hotel guests are eating breakfast we're eating light dinner and we're going to sleep for six hours basically um it's just ends up being a, a, a slow uh, a, a a short night of sleep and we wake up and for us, it's actually breakfast time at that time. And in reality, it's afternoon snack time, which you are preparing for the game. And we are preparing, we go and uh, have a, a video session, we have snack, and then we go to the, to the, we drive to the game. And actually it ends up being like a afternoon game for us, more or less, or noon game, um, which in some, in some areas it, it, it can happen. Sometimes you play at 12 or, or yeah. one o'clock. And it ends up being a, a, a game that's at noon and everybody is more or less okay. It's just you need maybe more time to warm up because you're just waking up right after the game. We, we hop right back on the plane and we're flying right back out. But the funny thing is that we, we, fly, we flew charter everywhere and we, we, fly, we flew from Moscow all the way to Siberia, uh, Krasnoyarsk. We stopped there, made like a pit stop for 30 minutes. We had we got we refueled, and we got back we got back up in the air and we flew another five hours something like that. It was like it was a ridiculous amount of of, of flying and the same way back. It was I mean, yeah, it, it was an like it was an experience. Story. 
Yeah. yeah. So that was back with Cheshka when you when you worked there. You worked there like for how long? Three and a half seasons. And then you you went straight into the, the Boston Celtics scouting job, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. My my last season, my last season with uh Cheska, I was that's where I started the national team as well. Uh, and, right. Uh, I was about to ask. Yeah. So, but that you just stopped recently, right? You did that yeah. for quite a quite a while, and yeah. now you you stopped doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Eight 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 years. Um, wow. Yeah. The federation the federation changed. The coaching staff changed. We have a good. I mean, the, the federation now the the team has a great coaching staff. They they have um, experienced assistant coaches all across the board, and it's it's a very good staff. So. For me, I have no harm feelings. I have no no kind of like bad um, memories. Everything is very lovely. I I enjoyed. I mean, it was tough. It was it was you at, at that point at that level. You have to deal with pressure, and that's something. Otherwise, if you can't right. deal with it, you can't you can't work at this level basically. And I I enjoyed. There's good stress and there's bad stress, and that definitely was good stress because you know the purpose why you're doing it. You're doing it for a higher like for for your nation basically you're representing something something bigger and um so that was good stress and, the, and all the sleepless nights in, in in the championships all worth it uh at the end you you either lose you lose or you win but you know you applied your whole your whole craft and the best thing about it is that everybody on the national team knows why they're there there's nobody slacking nobody's right. looking for their own stats everybody's invested because in lithuania nobody wants to come home as a loser that's the yeah. biggest everybody has this alertness within themselves that we're representing more than us we are representing our country we're representing our families we're representing our brothers and sisters and everybody goes in there for for one goal only and you know then you know when you applied yourself fully you laid everything out there you can come home with with uh with a clear conscience but a lot of times uh it's still a, a, a bad taste in your mouth, you know? So it's, it's, right. it takes a while, it, especially when you're emotionally invested, like I am, it takes me a while to get out of the hole. So sometimes it's, yeah. I, I probably, it's probably good to have this break. I get that. Honestly, I really get that. It's just been like, especially working with national teams for me in soccer as, as well as in basketball, it's just like, but there's an interesting thing you said. And I think I want to go back to that. It's just the, the pressure part of it, because I feel like in, in the, in the sports world, especially in like the high profile, um athletic sports world there's just one thing that always comes with it is like the pressure that that is already applied to it like for me it's like i have to bring you back as soon as possible if i can right i have to, yeah. to fix you basically for the next game yeah you have the pressure to find the right players more or less worldwide in your profession right now which is like obviously some pressure because you always have to deliver so i'm like just curious like what's your approach at that and like how do you go forward to just fly to certain places to watch games and how do you find this the the one jewel that basically hopefully enters the nba draft and gets drafted by the boston celtics one day uh, it's it's to be honest there's not that much pressure in my profession because i'm not a decision maker i i, I have right. to i have to have an opinion i have to make sure that i'm clear and i can justify my opinion i think that's the pressure i deal with that i i'm putting pressure on myself to have the right um justification not necessarily the right answer or the right like we are all having doing making educated educated guesses Nobody knows how the development will be of that kid in the next three, four or five years, you know? So we're all trying to see, we're all looking at the same player and we're all interpreting in different ways. And, and luckily we have some basketball experiences and I am luckily, uh, like, unfortunately I didn't play at the highest level, but I did play and I, I have, I have some experience that I can see. Sometimes I, I'm not really good at verbalizing what I see, but intrinsically, I know this probably is not going to work, you know, like, so um i there's certain things that certain times of pressure draft is is definitely pressure because you have to have all your things lined but it's also you come into the draft prepared it's not like you're preparing on draft day you already come into the draft everything all the work is done all the work is finished and you all honestly you know what you are getting yourself into and yet just then the leadership has to be ready to make have the right reactions to what's happening um the more pressure, most pressure I felt was doing the video work for the national team because you absolutely cannot miss once 
one small detail right. um, for, for, for several parts. Uh, first of all, not to give the, the players an excuse to say, hey, we didn't see that on video. We didn't. We, we're not prepared to see this. We didn't know what they play on the on the on the uh, that they baseline trap uh, on the post. We didn't know they have a one three one zone. Like you have to have all the all the bases covered. And sometimes, even when you show a player, like the the twelfth player on a national team, he's still good. I mean, like he's still a really good player. He's just having a smaller role. So you, I had an experience where. There was a, a, a guy, I don't want to say which national team, but it was it was a it was a middle tier team. And their 12th player, he came in and he was like just a feisty guy, like just on the ball, just just like he didn't play many minutes, but whenever he came in, he caused havoc. You know, he was on the ball, guarding, pressing, and he was tripping guys sometimes. Like he was just going and he was pretending like he's falling, but he was tripping. And I don't know if you can prepare a player for that, but you can make him aware that hey, this guy is plays in a different style he plays a little bit dirty he has a little bit of tricks in his sleeve and then it's on the player to remember that hey this guy i need to be more careful i need to be a, a aware of his feet and and because there's there's like some veterans have tricks you know and you have it's on you to notice it but also it's it's on like it's on me to notice it but it's also on me to verbalize it the right way so the players right. can remember it and that's the that's the most pressure I felt like a bit. I felt the pressure to prepare whenever I was presenting it. I didn't feel the pressure anymore because I felt the pressure to not miss any kind of clip that is useful to the players. But once I was preparing, once I was prepared, once I watched the games, you know, three, four or five games and you pick certain games that are also applicable to your defense, to how you play, because you're trying to think how the other coaches think. Then once you're presenting it, it's a logical presentation. It's not like I'm just presenting it just like a checklist things. You know, I'm presenting yeah. it because I have, again, going to you, a holistic view of the team. So in, the, in that sense, it's, it's similar to you have to take all the parts into consideration and present it to the, to the players in a way where they understand the identity of the team. Yeah. It's, and and then I can I can I can move on. I can connect this to the to my current job where I'm scouting players. It's also a holistic view you take you don't just scout one game or one practice you take the interview you take the the workout you take the camp you take the pro day you take this and it's 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 a collective view of things that you have to evaluate and then you have to make a decision based on that you know of, of a holistic view of the player I was about to ask that too, because I feel like that was really interesting. Last year, I had the, the opportunity to work during the NBA draft combine in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I worked with a few young guys and they had those interviews too, right? But like, that's already like your job is done at the NBA draft combine. Like it's just uh, the guys that get interviewed by the team are basically the guys that you put on a list more or less. Right, but you, I mean, they are on the list. And like most of the players are known anyway. So you, you just have to prepare and you have to see which ones you like, which ones you feel like you have the most potential. And you have to come into the, into the interview also prepared. You have to know some background questions that you can ask and check them on. You know? So will you, will you be there though? Like you are around doing those interviews at the NBA draft combine? Uh, not, at the, like, not at the combine because we have enough people there. So we gotcha. like the schedule doesn't always align. Yeah. um my priority is in europe my priority is with with, with different info like we had also zoom interviews so on the zoom interviews it's easier to be on board it's not always necessary but also not always possible for me to be there so i try to be uh, and i i am at, at all the all the interviews that are able that where i'm able to be in but also not all of them are accessible uh, because it's just not you know there's no my, my presence is it's not there and maybe there's no zoom no computer right. and that's just not not an issue but we have enough personnel to do that what's an interesting question for me is like i imagine myself as a young player fantasizing about playing in the nba right let's say you're 16 17 you you like slowly in the age where you probably draft a lot of interest from you guys as a scout What's a journey from your perspective of, let's say, a 16, 17 year old with the aspirations to play in a league one day? And what is the whole journey to it? Because I feel like even I didn't know anything about how a player actually gets drafted at the end. Like, especially when I was, as I, as I said, yet yeah, last year at the draft combine, I didn't even know that there are interviews. I didn't even know that there's like, like, you know, like those uh, um, practices where, 
where the teams attend to see how they move, how they play. If they fit the, the team, then there are, there are interviews to see what's their personality. Do they fit? Do you can, will they eventually be, be able to play with the stars of the team? Because that's always like a question as well. Obviously you don't want to put a trade, uh, you don't want to draft a player that is not really a fit mentally to the franchise. Um, so what is a typical journey from your perspective? Maybe you have an example. You don't have to say any name, but I'm just saying like maybe you have an example of a player that you first saw as a young player that later on ended up playing in the league. Um, it's, it's different with every player. You know, like there's like obviously the clear talents that you can't, you obviously you don't have to be a scout to see those guys. You know, like those guys are clear talents and they will just, it will just be a matter of who goes uh who will get drafted where you know yeah. like you know that they are um just natural fluid fluid athletes and talented that you it's naturally given um there's other guys that, is, that are have to earn it you know and that's the biggest that's the biggest crop that, that's the biggest area of finding the guy that really you think has maybe the biggest upside he's still some improvement to do and Uh, could potentially fit your team and it's also different from team to team that one team needs something right now maybe they need they are in a different stage of their uh, of their process right of the of the of the season of their seasons so when you're closer to the championship maybe you need more mature players you need more some, somebody that's closer to contributing to the team If you are a young and up and coming team and you're gathering assets, then you're able, you're probably looking for uh, investing in young guys and developing them and having long-term approach. So it's, there's a lot of things that you have to also take in consideration what stage you are in right now. But at the end of the day, teams also try to try to decide between cho choosing um, what the best player is available or whether or not um, this guy is may, may not be the best player right now, but in four or five years or three, four years from now, uh, you're like, you're sure to have a good role player, you know, like there's, and sometimes they turn into a star. Like, you don't know, there's, there's been stories of undrafted guys. There's been stories of second rounders that are turned into something bigger than expected. So um, it's so different from player to player. And you just have to really um, evaluate, like I said, holistically, and take everything into account and see, and I'm taking the top talents out. I'm just talking about the big chunk of guys that are going into one pot and you feel like um, that in this tier, you have the big discrepancy, you know, like it can go either way. I oftentimes hear that um, like something like Casey Yannis is never going to happen again because, because I feel like, or like another story I hear, and that just brings me back to what you just said about like being a late second rounder, Uh, a good example is Nikola Jokic, right? Like both of those players later on became MVPs. Both of those players were like overseen for a long time and later on got drafted, later on made a huge career in the NBA. So I feel like from a European perspective, that's just what interests me. And like, how was it possible to for Jokic to get drafted so late? Was it just because he wasn't developed that far? Was it because he was overseen? How was it possible that a Giannis was overseen for quite some time and just turned out to be laid on like such a jewel um i can't comment too much on those guys <laughs> oh, okay but uh, i don't i don't want to go into specifics um but i can keep it general it's like i said like um and that was before my time that i really knew how the draft was working and it's you know like meanwhile it's already almost what almost 10 years ago nine years yeah. ago And uh, times are changing, like social media is changing. Like it's, it's hard these days to miss somebody that's completely unknown. Yeah, and, you know, like Yanis was playing in the second division. And back then it was, you know, like it was lower exposure. Like it's lower. Now everybody, there's so many scouts that are not affiliated with the NBA, but they're like it's so many Twitter scouts, so many, like you, you, you get a lot of names um, and it's on me to check them. It's on me to find guys and to basically mostly to say no, <laughs> like mostly right. it's, it's the job. The main job is to say no. And, and of course there will be some, some guys that will come up eventually. And it's like, Oh, this guy uh, is, there's something there. You can't, you can't overlook it, you know? So I don't think, I don't think that um, 
you can't never say never that there's never going to be another another guy like that or another guy like this or 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 whatever but there there's definitely a uh, it's definitely easier today than it was 15 10 15 years ago 20 years ago now it's just so much access to information it's that uh, naval said it, i think naval said it that it's that that the person uh i don't I, i'm i'm not good with quotes but the the best the best person the best um I don't know what the word he used, but the most let's call it success. The most successful people are the ones who are able to distinguish uh, and filter out information. So it's more about filtering information than having information and getting information. You know, like you're gonna get it, you're gonna get it, but you have to distinguish and you have to filter it. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I have one last question for you, though. Um, so I'm like, you know, as a as a guy that's really ambitious, that's at least how I got to know you. Um, do you have a specific goal, let's say, for the next 10 years where it's going with you? Like, it, you know, like, it, well, is there a field that specifically interests you? Is it like scouting? Is it like scouting in the field you've been in Europe? Is it like, what, what do you, where do you see yourself in, in the next 10 years? Uh, I was going to ask a similar question, <laughs> but um, I, I don't see myself like, I don't, I'm an ambitious person, but I'm an ambitious person in the moment. Like I, I am an ambitious person um, in in what I do, and I let things take off from there. I don't like to say like I want to be there, and I know people tell me that. Like people just tell you need to be more um, focus oriented, uh, um, goal oriented. You have to go and and achieve this and go this and and that round and. I just I, I'm at a stage I, I don't want to force the issue. I want I let the game dictate of like where where i'm gonna fall in i'm if the celtics are happy with what i do great i'm i'm perfectly happy with with that as well because i work with great people and that's just that's the thing that i started to prioritize is working with great people in a day-to-day -day basis that you know that you can trust you know that there's no backstabbing you know that there's it's a, it's a very good environment it's a healthy environment uh we're we're we're, we're having a good balance between um working and enjoying work and having fun you know that's that's it's a, it's a, there's a clear line of communication and i value all those things over like being so driven and you know like be, like basically be careful what you wish for you know like i don't right. i don't yeah. i don't want to fall into the trap of like i want to be there and i would do this and then all of a sudden like i didn't enjoy the journey along the way and I became something that where I'm not happy yet, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I would be, but I just, I'm doing, I'm focusing on what I do. If it, that takes me to a certain place, great, but I want to enjoy the moment with the people and enjoy the process on to do, to, to wherever it takes me. I feel it's super, super healthy what you just said and super important what you just said, because I feel like for, for me personally, I've been in like such a rush in my 20s to become something and accomplish something and just like become better, become better every day. And just like it, it's been like such a pressure that I apply to my to my own self, which obviously led me somewhere. But at the same time, as you said, did I really enjoy the journey? Like it's been like a day-to-day -day hustle, which I'm like proud of. And I love to look back, but did you enjoy the moment? And I just feel like that's something that you have to learn and really to implement in life. And it's something that a lot of athletes in my experience not necessarily do because there's always something bigger to aim for, right? There's the all-star team, there's a championship, there's this, there's, there's money. Like there, there are like certain, certain things that you always trying to aim for and it, sometimes it it overshadows the the current moment you're in and it's actually really sad because sometimes you just want to look back and just like smile about certain moments in your career and i can still do that i'm just saying what you just said is like super healthy yeah and and um don't get me wrong i was i'm, I'm ambitious and i was ambitious i was going out when i was young younger i'm still young i'm still young <laughs> yeah you but but um I was like, as a player, I'm, I was very competitive, very ambitious. There's like just no, no, I, I don't have a way, a filter of showing the ambition and the, and the, and the competitiveness. Like, you know, it's, it's a different flow. So I, when I was, I started to coach, I was also like, you're, you're very involved in the moment, you know, and you don't feel where it's taking you, but it's taking you somewhere. You just don't feel it in the moment. But 
along the way, I did a lot of times I did not take my surrounding into account, you know, and just recently I had a brunch with a good friend in, in, in New York when I was uh, visiting there for, for, for some tournaments. Uh, she was said, she's, she was saying that, and she's like, she's, you know, uh, as, as a kid, like she's, she's older, like it's, 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 a, it's a friend of the family. And she was like, she has a lot of life experience. Uh, and she's like, life is people, you know, life is people. And it's simple as that life is people. And I think that um, this teaches us all a lesson of understanding of in the moment, what people you're dealing with day to day. It's a lot of times when the, the 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 father or the husband or it's not never at home because he's working and he's forgetting this, this his kids his wife you know his family the environment like the warmth in the house like you you got to be able to enjoy that as well and have to balance between the two while still being ambitious still being you know love loyalty from your partner and your support from your partner is important for your success but also you you got to value the peace that you have you know it's 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 something that should give you strength and then from that you can grow and, and become something more but you have to understand that life is people i must say i couldn't agree more and i'm like like you saying that makes me even more proud about the the main client that i currently work with because he really deals with everything in such a perfect way i feel like he's like for especially being a 30 year old nba player you know like you have you have a contract like you good for the next three years like a lot of players would just not do anything extra like this guy goes all in every day like yeah. and takes care of the family and it's just like obviously ambitious but like you know also patient with it like i feel like every player in the league who is ambitious wants to play a chip one day so that's obviously one big goal and i feel like this year we kind of close to that goal so we'll see how the, <laughs> how the playoffs go but um yeah i'm just like i just really it makes sense what you just said say his name <laughs> daniel tice <laughs> <laughs> we can't we can't keep that away i mean we're we're we're, we're all fam we're all family over here all family yeah nah, <laughs> but like i'm just like you know i just really respect him for even working with me because obviously they're would be different opportunities if you would be a character that's not committed to the game and committed to the daily hustle yeah of, of, of course i mean that's it's also you know this professional through and through so there's nothing nothing else to be right. you know to be added to that um what's the best best personal investment you did in the past oh every course i took legit like the word the bad courses i took or personal investment that personal like, personal yes oh my coffee machine <laughs> <laughs> honestly i'm a i'm a huge coffee fan i mean you know you know it you visited me and or we saw each other in in boston i even have one coffee machine if i'm at some point longer i take my coffee machine i take my grinder i have my espresso in the morning i go don't go anywhere for that because i know what the quality i have that comes out of the coffee machine so i feel my uh -huh. coffee equipment was definitely my best personal investment i ever did i ever made yeah that's 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 another reason why we hit it off <laughs> coffee a lot of a lot of coffee talk so where do you see yourself in 30 years sheesh yeah definitely not retired that's for sure yeah me um, neither I'm, so i'm 33 right now 30 years that's 63 as long as my hand's still working and then i'm not an old man that forgot about everything i am still working with athletes because like i can't think of a better thing to do in my life and i just hope that i got even more um more motivated and more experienced by then so i would love to you know at, at this point in my in my in my life i would love to to give knowledge away because that's how I learned the most, especially from like old dogs in the, in the business sports, physical therapy in Germany, especially in soccer is like such a old tradition. So when I did my course from the uh, Olympic Federation back then, there were like some old dogs and honestly, those guys tell you stories you benefit from. So mm -hmm. I, I would love to give away one day and especially if you're 63, you don't want to work like a maniac no more, but like you definitely still want to be in touch with that. And mentor, mentor younger guys. Yeah. 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 That's well, a good, definitely see that. that's a good, are there any, any books or channels, YouTube channels you can recommend for, for people interested in this topic and interested in, in, and also maybe for beginners, maybe for people who are just trying to get a, a grip on things. 
you know, YouTube, I find personally really difficult just because it's like such a jungle of like different things. That's why you ask for a specific channel. I'm like more a reader. So like I like every John Pierre Barral book that I could find. It's a French osteopath that has a mm. really precise approach. Like you really have to feel it in your fingers, really every nerve you have to feel and get a sense for the body, you get the sense for the whole system, basically like that taught me. That was one course that I took too early, but I luckily took a lot of videos. So like for me, it was just like back then when I was sitting in the course, I was like a young guy, like maybe three years in. And I was like basically not understanding anything he was talking about other than being precise. But that taught me a lot over the next upcoming years because I learned that precision in this industry, in my business, precision with the body, precision with like everything that has to do, especially with athletes, is the key to success. So like every Baral book, you will have a great choice. Can you spell that, Baral? Uh, it's B-A-R-R-A-L. Okay, Baral. Baral Osteopathy. You got uh, anything else for me? No, I think that was about it. I uh, ask you as many questions like... <laughs> <laughs> I, think we, we, I think we covered it all. One thing... I do, uh, I can throw it out here because we talked about like, where do I see myself? What I want to do? I do want to be, I do want to act in a movie one day. I mean, if that's like a, okay. a if that's yeah. like a, a, a takeaway that's off the, off the rails a little bit, like that would be something that I secretly as a kid, I always aspired to do. I just, I'm just going to put it out there in the universe, you know, like that's, that's legit whatever. how it works. <laughs> so, um, and that's like, completely like a child's dream that I had always being uh, I had like a Jim Carrey affiliation I was very I was I'm I'm, a, I'm a, like I can be I can be I can be nerdy I can be really um uh how do you call it um childish I can do I can do a lot of things so I I always uh I'm an open personality that's why I like you can see myself in all different colors and I feel like that's one thing that I I, I want to do before uh in the next within the next 30 years <laughs> hey if if daniel ever puts his life into a turns his life into a movie like we can still talk about it i think you should still play the role even in his life yeah. so maybe yeah, you but, know maybe we start with a side role hey we got to start somewhere yeah but that i would be acting myself then that's not that's not fun i mean it could be still fun i feel like you have a <laughs> have an exciting life so let's see how, how we can make that happen you know like maybe you get maybe you get scouted there then <laughs> well we'll see we'll see where that goes but um simon it's it's been it's been a pleasure to really get to know you a little bit more and get to know your profession which i think is also very important in in the sports industry i think that not many people value that as much as they should i think that this profession because i have personal um, experience uh, through my journey where i was really in a deep deep hole um emotionally when I was playing frustration I was in a dark place and osteopath osteopath um, helped me to bring the steps back to where at, at least I could play in the junior in, in, in the um, like semi-professional leagues where I could just play you know and enjoy and compete and and still life fully still live life fully you know and so I have a real great appreciation for this um, profession and i'm i'm glad that we could do this dual podcast back and forth i hope the people enjoyed it as well it was fun it was definitely fun i'm 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 thrilled uh whenever it's gonna come out i appreciate your kind words and i uh, can only give that back i feel like scouts are always overseen as i said they like sit in some corner and taking notes oftentimes so <laughs> uh i feel like they are like such a such a part of the such a part of the success of a franchise but oftentimes not really mentioned so i'm i'm happy that we can put this out there well thanks i think there's a lot of scouts that also appreciate this shout out to all the scouts in the in the in somewhere in the stand sitting <laughs> watching <laughs> all um, right thank th you thank you thanks for everybody for watching and and listening and uh simon danke dir bis bald <laughs>